Okay, so this is on this is um, on signal conditioning, and it's ILM thirty one oh three oh one D. Go to my slideshow from the beginning. Now, what do you see on that, Cole? Do you do you see everything? Do you see the whole? Yeah. Okay. So do you see a split screen or anything, or is it just the just the one screen? No, I see like the split screen. It almost looks like an editing page. Okay, you see that, eh? Okay. Let's try to take this out of there. So that's an editing page from the beginning. There we go. All right, signal conditioning. So you should see the just the one screen now. So the objectives um, for this are describe the function applications of signal transducers. Um, this is going to be mostly what this uh, ILM is about. <clears throat> describe the components, function, and application of a current to pressure transducer which is called your I to P. Signal transducers take signal from a variety of field instruments, uh, like your RTDs, your thermocouples, and they convert signals into standard instrument transmission signals. So a signal conditioner is a device that converts one type of electronic signal to another, like a, like a millivolt to a milliamp. This term has been replaced by the term signal transducer. It now also isolates and filters too. So uh, one of these things that we're talking about is actually an isolation device. It has galvanic isolation so that there's no direct connection to the field, uh, such as wires and grounding and things like that. It used to be more of a pneumatic to current machine, but it has evolved. Signal conditioners are used to convert the signals generated by a multitude of field equipment into a common signal that are used by the control system. So when we do that, it's sort of like, a, uh, you know, when we talk about that, we talk about a four to 20 milliamp signal. Signals, uh, conditioners are made of, uh, by many manufacturers. A variety, a variety of configurations are available, single and dual channel, and general and hazardous locations, etc. Some will even serve as transmitter power. So they can be powered individually or from a DIN rail. So you can actually plug these things into a DIN rail and they will be powered up or we can power them individually. So that's what they look like here. So when I look at this on the right hand side, I've just I've got a single, I got a single unit. And then on the uh, left hand side, I've got a power supply that powers the power bus on the back. And you can just put these signal conditioning modules you just uh, stack them on that DIN rail, clip them on. So this is a single channel. Now with the single channel, we only ha we have uh, input signal. So we we have uh, three input signals from the field. Uh, it shows you that on the on the on the left hand side, and on the right hand side we have an output. So the input could be milliamp coming in, and the output in this case would be some sort of uh, milliamp or voltage coming out. And in the bottom, we also have the power supply. So in this case, um, terminals one and two would be our power supply, 24 volt DC. So one set of selectable input terminals. So my input terminals are from my field device. Um, they're uh, plus, five is plus, six and seven. Uh, and then you can see that right here, and that's my isolation. So they're not electrically connected at all. So one set of uh, selectable input terminals, one set of output terminals. So power supply terminals for external power on the right hand side. And you can see that that signal here is that galvanic isolation right here. So galvanic isolation is a principle of isolating functional sections of electrical systems to prevent current flow. No direct conditioning path is permitted. So I use the, these things are used for 
hazardous locations. So I don't want to uh, have um, a direct path into a hazardous location. So we use these galvanic isolation. Energy or information can still be exchanged between the sections by other means, such as capacitance, inductance, electromagnetic waves, or by optical, acoustic, or mechanical means. So, but we are we are isolating it from the field. So this would be someplace where I'm going into a hazardous area and I need some sort of isolation. So gal galvanic isolation is used where two or more electric circuits must communicate, but their grounds may be at different potentials. It is an effective method of breaking ground loops. So those ground loops are, you know, when we have a transmitter stuff and we have wiring out to it, we always fold back the ground and we tape it onto our cable because we don't want any of these ground loops happening. So this way, uh, with, with these galvanic isolation, it, it breaks that ground. So in, in effect, methods of breaking ground loops by preventing unwanted current from flowing between two units, sharing a ground conductor. Galvanic isolation is also used for safety, preventing accidental current from reaching ground through a person's body. And then used to isolate the field wiring circuit from a control circuit. It breaks the link between input and output electronics. So if we have a short or something in the field, um, it, there's not enough potential there to start a fire. So that's what this is. What this is a dual channel one. So the one that we just showed you uh, was a single channel. This is a dual channel. So this has six terminals. Now you can see what the inputs are. Um, we can have a millivolt input. Uh, all these inputs on the left hand side are from the field, and then the power terminals uh, on the right hand side are the external. So when you see this galvanic isolation here, that means they're not electrically connected at all. And then back on the bottom of this place, we've got this power rail, and that's where the power rail would sit. If they have to be individually powered, um, you, you use these terminals. But if you can, if you snap them onto a DIN rail that is already powered up, then the power will come through here. So these two lines here mean galvanic isolation. So they're really not isolated or they are, they are isolated from each other so two sets of selectable input terminals two sets of selectable output terminals in this case so that's why it's called a dual channel and you guys have seen these um, many times okay then we go to these idp transducers um, we have some old clunkers out there that we used to have and those were those those fishers 546 um, you see those out there still quite a bit uh, because they're still functional, but the newer ones here are the, uh, the Emerson I2P. So it's it's uh, it's converting in this case here I, which is your current, and it converts it to pressure. So we talked about these a little bit, but we did this in first year. We talked about all this I to P stuff. <clears throat> So in this case here, this is my I to P um, that's on my valve. So this is my valve and then of course my valve stem. I have a pneumatic control signal here and I have compressed air. And it's uh, this one here is I to P uh, electronic converter. So in this case, I have electronic control signal and I have compressed air. So it takes my control signal and it moves it to air. So I to P current to pressure. Signal conditioning, IDP, current to pressure transducer, converts a 20 milliamp signal to pressure value to drive an end, end device, and that's typically a control valve. And these, these will mount right on the control valves. Utilizes coals, coils of electricity to move force balance flappers, causes pneumatic output in the end device. The application of these Signal transducers is required to convert a milliamp signal into a representative pneumatic output that is used to drive a funnel control element like, like just your common valves or your control valves. And we can split range. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a split range uh, with these uh, IDPs, but split range is accomplished by using two different IDPs and setting up your own outputs to fully range over the lower half of your milliamp. So when I have, a, say, two valves, for example, my lower half of my milliamp signal will stroke that valve fully 
and then the upper will also stroke another valve fully. So the lower half of your milliamp input span and the second I to P has its own output range over the upper half of a milliamp input. And I'll show you that. So in this case here, when I'm looking at this, I have only one 20 milliamp signal. So the signal comes in here in positive. There's my first I to P and this I to P will control that valve fully. And it controls that valve from four milliamps to 12 milliamps. That's for full stroke. And then of course the stroke is three to 15 PSI. Then it comes, then I have another I to P and this one, I set it to 12 milliamps to 20 milliamps for my full range here. So this one's four to 20, I should say four to 12 milliamps, and this one's 12 to 20 milliamps, where this one will stroke fully. So split range is accomplished by using two different IDPs, setting up outputs and fully range the lower half of your milliamp input span, and the second IDP have an output range over the upper half of the milliamp input. And that's it. So not a lot on this one. This is a pretty, as I say, this is only a few uh, pages long. So that's going to be the quickest one you're ever going to get, Cole. 